Welcome to today's presentation of the Diatom Web Academy. This is a series of talks that's being offered by the Diatom Taxonomic Certification Committee, uh, headed by Sylvia Lee. We have been working for a couple of years now to establish a Diatom certification program. There's now a level one certification in place that you can take through the Society for Freshwater Science. And our group is currently working to, de to develop the level two and three exams. So um, just in the process of developing these exams, we realized that we needed to provide training. And that was really the origins of the Diatom Web Academy. We started in late 2019 as a means to train and prepare people for the certification exam. Then in, in um, we had a couple other presentations. And then when March, when the pandemic started, we expanded our series and we've been offering a presentation every two weeks. And um, really beyond um, the certification program, our, this uh, forum has turned into a means to connect with each other for us to connect with our colleagues and you connect with each other um, and really encourage each other during these really very dark and difficult times. So here we are. <laughs> um, we will continue these presentations as long as we have the energy and we get our energy from you. So as long as we hear from you audience that this is important to you and of value and so your attendance and your feedback is really what drives that also if you'd like to volunteer to give a talk or suggest um, uh, speakers that's another way that you can be involved so before i turn it over to sylvia to announce today's talk i'll let you know that um, our next speaker will be Susie Thoreau on July 21st. And Susie will be talking about um, assessment programs in the state of California. Uh, so please join us then. And Sylvia, would you introduce today's talk? Oh, Sylvia, so can't hear you. You don't have a little red dot on your screen, but so something else. There we go. There you you can hear right. me now, right? Okay. Welcome everyone to the Diatom Web Academy. Today's talk will be by Marina Potapova and Mark Edlin. Um, Mark, would you please introduce Marina? Sure, I'd be happy to. Marina stepped up to give the second webinar that we've had uh, had her present. Um, thank you, Marina, for that. Marina, of course, is the curator of diatoms at the, at the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia. She's also an associate professor in the Biodiversity, uh, Earth and Environmental Science Department at Drexel University. Um, Marina's uh, long been one of our one of our our favorite diatomists we all have visited her in philadelphia at the diatom herbarium where she's always been welcoming and today she's going to be presenting on navigating diatom nomenclature giving us some of the rules that guide how we name species what names we want to use and why names change sometimes and how we can just uh, understand that process marina thank you for speaking today and if people Thank would you. Like, yeah, if people would like to ask questions during the talk or have something that is, is not clear, please type that into the chat. And of course, please also type your name and where you're coming in from in the chat if you haven't done that as well. Thank you very much. Thanks, Marina. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so just once again, what Mark said, I just want to reiterate, um, we are welcome. Uh, uh, questions in the middle of the talk. So you can type and if Mark thinks, Mark will be monitoring that uh, chat window. And if he thinks um, the, we need to stop and discuss that question, he will interrupt me 
will be uh, <clears throat> glad to discuss um, the issues you may have. So um, we're talking today about basic concepts and rules of biological nomenclature and their applications in diatom research. <clears throat> Interesting that I cannot move my, huh. Okay, it just de it delayed. Um, so first of all, I'd like to define uh, what nomenclature is and how it is different from taxonomy. So what taxonomies do? Taxonomies class are classifying organisms by grouping them into taxa. While um, nomenclature is about naming this taxa applying names which are basically labels. <clears throat> names are published, while taxa are described. That's the difference. So biological nomenclature, basically it's a communication tool for taxonomists and practitioners. If you know the rules of biological nomenclature, it helps you to allocate names to taxa. And why um, uh, do we need to understand these rules? One reason is that taxa names often change. Sometimes uh, one species is split into several others. Sometimes several species are merged into one. And for everyone who is a little bit familiar with diatome research, you're all aware that uh, names of species are being moved between um, genera quite often. So the question is, which name or names should be applied to these taxa which change their concept? So here, rules of nomenclature help you to decide. Uh, diatoms are treated by a code of botanical nomenclature. So that's the um, assembly of the rules. There are other codes of biological nomenclature, such as zoological. Uh, there is a code for prokaryotes, for bacteria, and also for viruses. Uh, all of these codes of biological nomenclature um, <clears throat> use Linnean or binomial nomenclature, meaning that each species name consists of two parts, genus and species. Then there is a third part of the name, and this is the name of the author of the name, of the taxon name. Often that third part is omitted, but then I'll talk later why it's actually, this is very important part of the name. So here you can see a diatom that um, many of us know. Um, those uh, who work in North America, we know it as Navicula canalis. So Navicula is the genus name, generic name. Canalis is species name or specific epithet. And the convention is to write this in italics. Then you have the name of the person who um, established that, published that name. Uh, who happened to be Ruth Myrtle Patrick, a famous American diatomist. Names below the rank of genus are combinations. They consist of a generic name combined with one or two epithets. If you are dealing with infraspecific taxon, below species rank, you will add another epithet, the third epithet, um, to the genus and species name. Okay, so here is the story with this particular species Navicula canalis, <clears throat> that we know as Navicula canalis. You arrive to that name if you are using, if you have in your hands one of the North American diatom floras. But if you happen to use some European flora, for example, these diatoms of Europe, Navicula sensus stricta, you will arrive at a totally different name. Accordingly to that flora, it will be called the same exact diatom, will be called Navicula vandami. Um, and the author's name are Schumann and Archibald. So what, this is obviously the same taxon, what name is correct? Uh, how, um, how to arrive at the correct name? Nomenclature is here to help you. That's why it's important to understand. So um, as I said, um, diatoms are treated within botanical um, uh, code of nomenclature. It's also known as ICN, International Code of Nomenclature for algae, fungi, and plants. <clears throat> it's a set of rules, articles, and recommendations. There are also notes and examples that help you to understand the code. Um, the important point here is that um, the code is changing 
The first code uh, of botanical nomenclature was published in 1867 by Alphonse de Candolle, the famous uh, Swiss botanist. And now the current uh, active edition is 17th, number 17. It's also known as Shenzhen Code because it was adopted at the Shenzhen International Botanical uh, Congress in 2017. Um, uh, so there have been 17 versions of the code. And uh, uh, lately, in the re recent decades, um, the code is changing. A new version, a new edition is adopted every six years. The last two versions, the last two editions are available online. So here is the link for you for, to the latest version. The problem with the code um, is that it's, it's a big publication and it's very densely packed with, with information. It's not an easy read. So most of us um, mm, who have like other things to do in life, for the us, it's difficult to inter interpret that code. So we need some help. And so here we listed um, two resources which we find uh, the most helpful um, for uh, interpreting the code. The first one is the code decoded publication by Nick Turland. It's recent, it's just published last year. It's available online freely. So here is the link for you. This is basically translation of the most essential, essential parts of the code to plain English. But it's written by a botanist. So it's not adapted to the needs of diatom researchers. Then the second resource is the key to diatom nomenclature. So it's really for us. <clears throat> so this is uh, a paper published by Regina Jan and uh, Wolf Hennig Kuzber in Diatom Research in 2009. Um, uh, it's a great resource. The only problem is it's already 11 years old. And since that, that time, there were already two versions of the code uh, published. So the central question I want to address today in this publication, it's uh, this one, how are names applied to taxa? The, uh, the short answer to that question is, the application of the name of a taxon is determined by a nomenclatural type. So that's what we are going to uh, talk about, the types, nomenclatural types and their importance. <clears throat> so you can think about type as an anchor that is anchoring a label, which is name, anchoring it to taxon. So when you think about tax below genus uh, rank, the type, the nomenclatural type is often, uh, is, is usually a specimen. Occasionally, in some exceptional cases, it could be an illustration. Uh, but basically, it's usually a specimen to which the name of a taxon is permanently attached. Therefore, a name, but not a taxon, has a type. When we say this is the type of such and such taxon, we really mean, but this is the type of the name. The tax concepts of taxa are constantly changing, but the name is anchored. <coughs> um, the very common misconception about the type, that it um, should be some kind of most typical example of a particular taxon, some kind of ideal or model organism, or maybe like organism that has all the features of the taxon, or it's kind of like central morphological, like an average representative of that taxon. This is wrong. This is, it, uh, the nomenclatural type doesn't have to be that most typical example. That uh, idea dates back to 19th century when morphological or classification concept of type was commonly um, used. When people talk about morphological type, they really meant model organism, but it's not subject of the code. ICN deals with nomenclatural types. This uh, concept of type is so central um, to uh, biological nomenclature that since uh, um, 1958, it's mandatory to include the type when publishing a name of a new taxon at the rank of genus or below. So how uh, do we know, if we're looking at some name, how do we know uh, if it's a correct name? How do we choose correct name for taxon? The code actually says there is only one correct name for a taxon. How um, do we know if what we are looking at is the correct name? 
Should we use that analyst or one dummy for that diatom that I was uh, showing early? Um, sometimes we have much bigger uh, option, uh, like number of options to choose from. So here is the basic um, rule, how you arrive at the correct name. So this diagram on the left shows you how you figure out if the name you're dealing with is correct. So first of all, um, uh, in order to be correct, the name should be effectively published. So effective publication means that the name is published in a printed matter, which is available to general public. It should be distributed to botanical institutions with libraries accessible to botanists, meaning that you can describe new taxa at uh, meetings, abstracts, newspapers, and publish dissertations or exequati. It should be either a book available in libraries or journal. So that's effective publication. <clears throat> and only names published effectively can be validly published. Uh, so what do we mean by valid publication? Validity is also a very important concept because code is only dealing with valid names. Non-valid names are not even names from the point of view of the botanical code of nomenclature. They're just designations. For a name to be validly published, um, that publication should follow certain rules, uh, which are basically concentrated in these articles from 32 to 45 in the code. So here are the requirements of valid publication of a name. First of all, the name should be formed in accordance with ICN rules. And I'll talk later about what these rules are. The name should be assigned to a valid genus or species, if you're talking about infraspecific taxon. Then the rank of this, uh, this taxon should be indicated. Rank of the name, sorry, should be indicated. Then there should be description and diagnosis. And now we are allowed just to publish that description in English. But before 2012, a Latin description was required. The diagnosis, so the description basically is the list of, characteristic of the, uh, characteristics of the new taxon. While diagnosis um, explains how this new taxon is distinguished from other taxa. And in practice, we usually, when we write this uh, diagnosis, we explain how that taxon, uh, taxon is different from the most similar ones. Diagnosis can be incorporated into description or it could be a standalone um, paragraph. Then the type, the nomenclatural type must be indicated and the indication is done by including words typos or holotypos in Latin or analog in modern language, which is in English would be type or holotype. Then an illustration or figure showing distinctive morphological features prepared from the actual specimens, including the holotype, should be given. Finally, the herbarium location and herbarium collection or accession number of the holotype should be noted in the protolog and the description. <clears throat> um, and specimen or type must be set aside in a recognized repository, herbarium. This is literally what the code said. It should be recognized repository. <clears throat> So those are absolute requirements of valid publication of um, botanical names. But in addition to these um, strict requirements, there are recommendations, there are recommendations. And if you're publishing in a uh, respected journal, if you're publishing some new name, the editors usually ask you, require you to follow these recommendations. Uh, we call them best practices. So here, um, the most important uh, for, diatom, for publishing diatom names. So names, uh, name of a new taxon, new combination, new rank or replacement name, um, and ranks are indicated by these abbreviations. This is a, just a convention, but that's how we indicate them. Like a spin-off means that you're introducing new species name. Gen-off, you're introducing new genus uh, name and so forth. Another best practice is to designate a single specimen as the holotype. Here is a little bit of difficult situation because if you read these articles in the code, the language is a little bit vague. So definition of single specimen is um, not entirely clear. It varies among diatomies. So here we are in a little bit gray area. 
So there are some discussions uh, um, in between us, what exactly is a single species. Then a good practice to deposit in addition to holotype, that main specimen to which the name is attached, also to deposit additional original material, um, such as isotypes and samples from which you made that slide on which your specimen, your holotype specimen is sitting. Um, <clears throat> then another best practice is to indicate the uh, collection details of the holotype, such as full locality, date of collection, name of collector, and any collecting number. Even though merely citing a unique specimen identifier and herbarium code can be sufficient for valid publication, it is very helpful to give more information about the type. And a responsible editor of a journal usually asks you for doing that. So all these elements I just uh, went over in the previous slide and here, all these um, elements associated with publication of a new name, we call them protolog. So if you uh, go back to all these requirements, number one here for the requirement for the valid publication it says the name should be formed in accordance with ICN rules. So let's talk a little bit more about what these rules are. So number one, name is composed only of letters of Latin alphabet. The name of a species is a combination of name of genus and specific epithet. We learned that already. The how you form species name specific epithet. It can be derived from any source, whatever. It's either an adjective agreeing in gender with generic name. It could be a genitive uh, noun, noun is genitive case, nominative noun, or a word treated as such, or two more united or hyphenated words. The specific epithet is not allowed to repeat the name of the genus. So the name such as navicula navicula is invalid. The name of infraspecific taxon is a combination of a genus name, species name, and infraspecific epithet. <clears throat> and the infraspecific epithet is formed exactly in the same way as specific epithet, the same rules that I, I mentioned above. <clears throat> a rank denoting term is placed immediately before the infraspecific epithet. Rank denoted term is basically bar for variety, F for forma, uh, form uh, then SSP for species. So here is an example of a variety. Zimbella, genus name, Neocystula, species name. Barb, here variety is rank denoting term. And then Islandica, that infraspecific epithet. Uh, note that that rank denoting term is not part of the name and it's not written in Italian. Then you have Kramer, who is the author of the name and the year of publication which is also very helpful to add when you're talking about um, the taxa. I'm not going into a, details on uh, botanical Latin, it's just too much. Just giving you some examples here of uh, Latin names of diatoms, which are correct and they formed correctly. So if you look at the first three ones, those uh, here are specific epithets, there are adjectives and they agree in gender with uh, genus, uh, generic names. For example, aneomastos is in neuter, in gender, so the specific epithet is minor, is not minus. Um, sorry, it's masculine. <laughs> so it would be minus if it was neuter. So you have navicula lancelata, it's feminine. Navicula is feminine. Uh, so lancelata, the ending is a, not lancelatum or lancelatus. Acnantidium is neuter. So the ending is U-M, uh, minutissimum, not minutissima, or U, uh, minutissimus. Uh, minutissimus. <laughs> then you have several examples when the specific epithet is a noun. Uh, like in the case Navicula Antoni, this is, um, uh, noun is genitive uh, case, and it's named after a person, so it's after Anton. <laughs> Uh, then uh, the last two examples are also genitive nouns. Uh, here, the names are honoring some geographic places. And then uh, Peronia fibula, here we have noun is uh, in nominative uh, case. So fibula is just calf bone. So apparently that's how Peronia uh, looks like, like a calf bone. So just uh, let's call that name. Uh, 
um, there are also some rules about how to form general names correctly. And uh, the important one is that the genus name cannot be based on a morphological term. Apparently, this um, rule was not very well known because um, relatively recently, um, uh, in 2000, Kramer published this uh, new uh, genus name, Pulkela, um, for some um, species which were mostly previously in Pinularia. Pulkela or Pulchella is Latin for small and beautiful. So it's mor morphology, basically, it describes morphology. So it's invalid. That makes that genus name invalid. So it's designation, not even a name. So Mark uh, and Michael Wynn last year proposed um, another name to a valid name. Uh, so they published a new name uh, for that genus. Uh, now it's Pulkella ficus. So they had to transfer all the species which were sitting in that Pulkella, that invalid genus, to that Pulkella ficus. <clears throat> I just made one. Okay, so, um, so we went through effective publication, so then valid publication. Okay, then the next thing is that some valid taxa can still be incorrect. They can be illegitimate. This is another bad thing about being like uh, those that can happen to a taxon name. It could be illegitimate. And we only want legitimate taxa. Only legitimate taxa can be correct. So what it, does it mean to, to have a legitimate name? So legitimate name is the one published in accordance with all the rules and priority of the name and date of publication, meaning that the published name is available and has not been previously used. There are two categories of illegitimate names, uh, later homonyms and nomenclaturally superfluous names. So let's go through some examples of later homonyms. So homonym means that two more names are, they have exactly the same spelling, but they're based on different types. So here is a recent example. If you're counting diatoms um, here or in Europe, um, freshwater diatoms, you should be familiar with this species. We used to call it Navicula richardiana since the name Lange Bertolot described it in 1989. In just last year, um, Wolfgang Kuzber just discovered that exactly the same name was already published in 1906. So, which means that Navicula Richardiana Lange Bertalot is illegitimate. It's later homonym. So now a new name uh, is published for that taxon. It's now Navicula Meta Richardiana Lange Bertalot. So that's where the importance of the author name comes in. Navicula Richardiana Lange Bertalot. It's a different diatom, different taxon from Navicula Richardiana Grunov Nigula. So that's why it's important actually to put the name of the author <coughs> after the species and um, specific episode. There are more complicated ways of generating homonyms. <coughs> so let's look at this one. So two infraspecific taxa within the same species, even if there are different ranks, are homonyms, if they are not based on the same type, but they have the same final epithet. So their infraspecific epithet is the same. So look at this situation. I was actually talking about that when I was giving the seminar back in April, March, was it March, about the, these planetidiums. So look at this story with this uh, name. So in 1911, Husted, the famous um, German diatomist, um, Frederick Husted, Husted, published this name, Acnantus lanceolata variety rastrata. That's his original publication. You can see it here. Um, okay, so later in uh, 1957, the same person, Husted, makes a new combination based on um, Acnantis rastrata, which was described by Ostrup in the beginning of 20th century. Kushtet makes a new name, new combination. He moves uh, Acnantis rastrata, he changes the status actually. He makes it a form of Acnantis lanceolata. So his name is Acnantis lanceolata forma rastrata. 
if you look at all three components of these two names, they're spelled exactly the same. It does not matter that the rank denoting term is different. It's variety in the case of Hushtet 1911 and it's forma in case of 1957. The later name is a homonym and it's illegitimate. Okay, to make things even worse, worse Langebert Alot in 1993 publishes another um, uh, name, Acnantis lanceolata subspecies restrata, thinking that somehow giving a different rank makes it a legitimate name. No way, it's illegitimate name again. So these two latest names are illegitimate. This is pretty important because we are talking about um, uh, two diff completely different taxa. Later, Carlos Wetzel and co-authors um, investigated types, uh, type material of both taxa, Hushtet 1911, and this one based on Hnantes uh, Rastrata Ostrup, and those are completely different diatoms. Then um, another case of um, illegitimate name is superfluous name. Uh, here, two or more different species names um, uh, uh, are attached to the same type and they're within the same genus. So look at this example. So we had Sembella hilprenensis published by Foget. Now we know these uh, um, diatoms like that, they, we, the agreement that, uh, is to um, place them in the genus Embapleura. So the new combination was made by Kramer and he made it correctly, so he made a combination Simba Pleuro Hilprenensis. But then Lauren Balls, uh, 14 years later, made another combination Simba Pleuro Boreo Americana. So within the same genus Simba Pleuro, you have two different names and they go back to the same type. So the latest one is illegitimate. <laughs> it's important to note that infraspecific name may be legitim legitimate even if it's published under illegitimate species name. And in the same way, name of a species may be legitimate even if it was published under an illegitimate generic name. This is not to be confused when, with names that are not validly published. Species cannot be validly published under a genus that was not validly published. So just to reiterate the importance of the name of the authors. This is really important because as I showed you before, the, because of the homonyms. <clears throat> For example, in addition to that, Acnantis lanceolata variety restrata, Hushtet 1911, there is another taxon based on a different type, has exactly the same name, Acnantis lanceolata variety restrata, uh, Paul Schultz. And then there is Acnantis lanceolata variety restrata, Ostrup Hushtet. <coughs> All different taxa based on different names, different diatoms meant by these names. There are different ways of citing uh, names of the authors. You can spell them, spell them out, but the convention is to use abbreviations following International Plant Name Index. Here is the link. You can see how uh, the names of um, the authors are abbreviated. Not everyone is there. Not, not everyone who ever described or published a new name, but many people are. If the names of the authors of a taxon are not the same as the authors of the publication where that new name was introduced, it's customary to add in to indicate that public, the authors of publication. Sometimes the author of an invalidly published name is recognized by the author of the new valid name by using this notation X. So here, look at this example of a name which is in red, Acnantis Pork Tata. In brackets, you have Brebison X William Smith, and then after brackets, you have Grunov in Cleve in Grunov. Just looking at all this, um, uh, you can tell what happened here. So what happened actually, William Smith described Acnantidium Quarctato. He is the author of that name, not Brebison. But just because of the courtesy, William Smith referred to Brebison in um, designation. So Brebison didn't publish anything. It, maybe he mentioned some name, but he didn't validly publish it. It was William Smith who did it, but he was just mentioning Brebison. Then that species, Acnantidium carcatum, was moved to another genus, Acnantis, by Grunov. So Grunov is the author of the new combination. 
but he did it in the uh, publication authored by Cleve and Grunov. So that's why you have in. So the real authors here are William Smith and Grunov. Okay, another important part, remember like I was going through um, valid publication of names. It's to designate a type of the new species. How correctly designate type of the new species? As I said several times already, it's specimen. The type is a specimen. But before 2007, illustration was allowed as a type. There are several exceptions. I'm, I'm not going into fossil diatoms right now. This is a whole other story. But in general, for algae, um, uh, illustration is allowed when it's very difficult to preserve a, a specimen. In the world of diatoms, it doesn't happen very often, but occasionally diatoms can be very, very lightly silicified, so you cannot preserve their first tools. So in that case, you can publish illustration um, uh, as a holotype. So what exactly is the specimen? For most of us practicing diatomists, we agree, like at least Mark and I, we agree, and many people who we know, we work with our colleagues, we agree that single valve or first tube marked on a microscope slide is a specimen. But some diatomists interpret the wording as a code as allowing them to designate a whole slide as a type. Imagine that environmental sample, so you have zillions of different species, and many representative of the same taxon you're working with, and you designate the whole slide. You're not marking a single specimen. This is the source of uh, trouble in the future. So that's, we don't consider that a good practice. But unfortunately, people are publishing these names. Um, what happens in the future when this material designated as type is found to belong to more than one taxon, a lactotype, the secondary type may be designated. So what kind, kinds of types can be designated by the author of a new species? First is holotype, um, that's the main type. Then there are isotypes, any duplicates of the type. And isotype is always a specimen. If you happen to designate uh, an illustration as a holotype, there cannot be any isotypes. Then there are scene types. This is um, mostly thing from the past. That happened uh, when uh, the Types were not required for valid um, um, publication. So it's any specimen cited in the protolog when there is uh, no holotype or any of two or more specimens simultaneously were designated uh, as types. <clears throat> there are also isosyntypes. They're not really much used in the atom world. And there are paratypes. Paratypes. Um, that's what the article of the code says. It's any specimen cited in the protolog besides holotype, isotypes, or syntypes. In diatom world, this means a specimen from a sample different from the sample from which you designated holotypes. So here is an example of a good quality um, uh, species description of protolog, which follows all the rules. So you have the name of the taxon, Alocazera squarzovi in italic. You have um, names of the authors in the name of Markenland and uh, Gene Sturmers uh, are abbreviated according, accordingly to IPNI rules. You have a spin-off, um, indication of name and rank. You know, it's effectively published. That name is effectively published because it's published in journal in Phycology, which is the journal which is distributed widely across the world. There is an illustration. There is a description in Latin because that name was published in 1996. There is also translation into English. You, you can see that the holotype is deposited in, um, in our herbarium at NSP. This is code of the herbarium. The figure of the holotype is uh, um, uh, given. You have isotypes deposited in the collections. You have type locality, well-described etymology. Taxon is named in honor of um, Boris Skvartsov. You have also diagnosis here, which tells you how that species is different. Another example is of taxonomic revision. <clears throat> so here we're going to talk a little bit more about all these new names and new combinations. So this is the case I just picked up randomly. This is Acnanthus biparoma. <clears throat> this genus, uh, sorry, this uh, species was described uh, effectively 
and validly in its legitimate name. So here is your prior dialogue. It has all required components, indication of the rank. Um, uh, this is species. You have Latin description translated into English. You have original illustration. You have holotype, type locality, everything well described. Okay, let's see what happens. <clears throat> Happened to that name. 1991, uh, Langeberg-Hello decides that this um, particular taxon does not deserve to be a species on its own and makes it a subspecies of Acnantis lanceolata. So he is trying to publish a new status, a name which indicates a new status. Unfortunately, he made a mistake in that uh, he didn't um, cite correctly the place of publication of Basianium of Acnantis biparoma which made that name invalid. <clears throat> so he corrected that mistake two years later. So now we have validly published Acanthus lanceolata subspecies by Barrow. Two years later, another new combination is made by um, David Tsarnecki in Tsarnecki and Edlund. So they, uh, Tsarnecki moved <clears throat> Acanthus by Paroma into a different genus. So that's new combination, combination of uh, another genus name with the same specific epithet. By Paroma. Two years later, another new combination, that same species is moved to another genus, Acnanteopsis. By the way, that genus is illegitimate, but remember I said that doesn't make a species illegitimate, the species is legitimate. Two years later, another new combination, the same species is moved to an yet another genus, Planetidium, and that's how we know that how we use that um, name right now, Planetidium by Paroma. If you look through all these names and also the name of Basianium, Acnantis by Paroma, they are all based on the same type. That's why we call this homotypic or nomenclatural or objective synonyms. So that's important to understand. When they're based on the same type, they're homotypic. So what are the rules for valid new combination and new status publication? First of all, Basianium needs to be legitimate name. And then full and direct reference to Basianium must be given by the author of that new combination or a new status. Remember that case with 1991, it was not valid because the place of uh, publication of Basianium was not published, uh, cited completely. So here you have an example uh, when Langebrelot was moving the Tacnantus biparoma into Planetidium, that was done correctly. You have um, the name of Basianium and all the details of um, uh, Basianium uh, are given here, author, year, journal title, page, figure number. If something is missing, the name is invalid. What happens if the Basianium is illegitimate? You still can publish a new name based on that, but instead of the new combination, you have to publish a replacement name, nomen, no, nomen novo, nom nov. And you have to cite previously validly published basic. It, it has to be valid. <clears throat> so here is the question that some people can ask. Why could not Langebert allot given you completely new specific epithet, Agnantes by Paroma, when he was transferring that name to Planetidium? For example, why couldn't he name it, say, Planetidium Patrick here or whatever? <clears throat> there is the answer from the code. This is because the final epithet has to be the earliest legitimate name of the taxon in the same rank. <clears throat> but if the new combination results in an illegitimate name, a homonym, in that case, you are supposed to uh, make a new, completely new specific epithet, a replacement name. You cannot make a new combination in that case. You need to come up with a replacement name. This is not the end of the story with this Agnantes by Paroma that went through that so many changes. <clears throat> Something else happened to that species. So this is change of species concept. We recently changed our understanding of the limits of that species. So um, if you follow the um, uh, diatoms of North America pages, if you're using it for identification, you may have noticed that uh, we changed recently the page of that taxon, and this is why. So if you look at these images in this slide, four images, you can see that um, 
they actually they were on that page for planetidium by Paromo, and I, I I made that page like a long time ago. And why I put these um, all these images together under that name? This is because that was the um, accepted um, concept uh, of that species. It was the same concept that it was used in the Tombs of North America by Patrick and Reimer in. Um, Susvasar flora of uh, uh, Middle Europe by Kramer Lange Bertalot. So all these taxa together, uh, these uh, organisms together were in that taxon, which we call Plantidium by Paroma. Okay, Wetzel, Carlos Wetzel uh, looks at this Donna page. See like how people are using diatoms of North America. He looks at this and says, you know what? I see two different taxa here. They're different. These guys with capitate ends, they're different from those on the right. They did a little bit more exploration. They asked me for the type material. I sent them the type slide. Um, and they figured out that the, the uh, organisms with uh, diatoms with capitate ends, they actually, they correspond to the type. So the label, Plantidium biparoma, Atlantis biparoma, was attached to these guys. So this is the type specimen here. So that name, when you split that species, which was wide in its circumscription, if you split it in two species, the name stays with these guys with capitate ends. And for those on the right, which have more uh, rastrate or subrastrate ends, um, a new name was introduced. This is completely new taxon. That's why the types are so important. They, tell, they basically anchor the name and they tell you where the name goes when you split the text. So the, uh, that now we have two pages. So um, uh, the specimens on the right are now in Plantidium and Curiatum. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's important to have a type. What happens if there is no type? That ca happens very frequently in diatom research because names published before 1958 uh, didn't have to, to have types. Or type um, may get lost or found to be ambiguous. For example, containing more than one species or several specimens may be cited as types. This leads to unstable application of the name. And you fix it by the means of typification. So you are, um, if you want to fix that situation, you have to designate a lector type. And the correct way of the choosing a lector type is to select it from the original material. Original material is material which was in the hands of the author of um, that, that name <coughs> who described that, that taxon. Um, you have to select, there are rules how the lector type should be selected. If there are isotypes, you have to select it from isotypes. If there are no isotypes, you may then the next step to select it from syntypes. If there are no isotypes on syntypes, you can select it from paratypes. If nothing of those is present, no specimens are present, you can use any illustration published as part of the protalog or any other specimens or and published unpublished illustrations that the author associated with the taxon and that were available to the author no later than the preparation of the valid description. This is literally how the code um, says it. <coughs> Occasionally, there is no original material left, left whatsoever. In that case, instead of lectotype, uh, you're allowed to designate neotype. This is completely different type. You just go and collect a new sample. And the best practice is to collect the, that new sample from uh, the type locality or some place nearby, just to increase the chances of actually hitting the same taxon that original author had in mind. So this is um, a chart from the, which shows classification of types, types of types. Um, uh, we showed that slide four years ago at the International uh, Diatom Symposium in Quebec when um, <coughs> presenting that um, talk about this um, best practices in nomenclature and designating types. So here you have in the upper row the types which are um, designated by original authors, holotypes, Holotype, isotype, paratype, syntypes. And then the options for later researcher. So if there is no type exist, you can either designate lectotype or neotype. But occasionally the type exists, but it just doesn't provide enough information for your purposes. In that case, 
um, we are allowed to designate interpretive type, which is called epitype. For example, you want to have a DNA sequence associated with your taxon. And you cannot just get DNA from the datum, from a frustule or valve, which is sitting on the permanent slide. So what, what do you do? You go and collect the sample. Uh, you isolate um, the taxon. You have to believe that it's the same that uh, <clears throat> the author of the name meant that it corresponds to the original type. You, you grow that clone, you can extract DNA, so you, now you have DNA sequence, and you also can um, save some of the specimens as epitypes. Now we're going back to the original question, the central question of this presentation, how to find the correct name of a taxon. So we figured out which names are effectively published, validly published, which are legitimate. If you have two legitimate names, for example, Navicula canalis and Navicula vandami, both are legitimate. How do you know which one is correct? Simple answer here, the one which was published earlier. So this is the principle of priority. If you don't know when they were published, there is a variety of nomenclature resources available online, such as Diatom Base or Algae Base, or you, you can look at um, Diatoms of North America if the species are there. You can see that after an author name, you often see the um, year of publication. Navicula canalis published in 1944, Navicula vandami 1987. Easy answer, Navicula canalis is the correct name. <clears throat> so in this case, Navicula canalis and Navicula vandami are two names based on different types. They refer to the same taxon, but they're different, based on different types. So we call them, because of that, the heterotypic or taxonomic or subjective synonyms. Um, according, in accordance to Article uh, 11.4, for any taxon below the rank of genus, the correct name is the combination of the final epithet of the earliest legitimate name of the taxon at the same rank with the correct name of the genus or species to which it is assigned. That correct name is, can be chosen from both nomenclatural homotypic or taxonomic heterotypic synonyms. One more example here. Um, this diatom, uh, common in southeastern United States, was uh, described by Hushtut as Navicula punctifera in 1952, and it was transferred to Gisleria in 2005. It was described again as Navicula akinensis. Patrick. Patrick just didn't know about um, Navicula punctifera hushtut. So she described as Navicula akinensis. It was also transferred to Gisleria by other authors. Then it was described the third time as Gisleria schmidi in 2000. So Navicula punctifera, Navicula akinensis, Gisleria schmidi, they are heterotypic synonyms based on different um, types. Navicula punctifera and Gisleria punctifera are homotypic synonyms. Navicula aikinensis and Gisleria aikinensis are homotypic synonyms. Doesn't matter, you have to choose correct name from all this assembly of names. How do you know which one is correct? You look at that article 11.4. Any taxon correct name is combination of the final epithet of the earliest legitimate name. The earliest legitimate name uh, in that rank is Navicula punctifera. So punctifera, and with the correct name of the genus to which it is assigned. We are assigning it within Gisleria now. So it's Gisleria punctifera is the correct name. So this is um, <clears throat> an illustration from Turland, from that resource um, uh, I was raving about. Uh, so how you choose, so it's filter, nomenclatural filter, how you choose correct name. So effective publication, and you check if it's valid publication. And you check if the type exists, if the typification was done, because you need to know like if the type actually it's what you're looking, if your taxon is actually corresponding to that type, then you check for legitimacy, if the name is legitimate. And then you have, if you have several legitimate name and they all pass through these filters, you look at which name has priority and you select that one as the correct. Finally, I'm just showing this table here. I'm not going to, into details of that table, but it helps, it's just like a helpful resource for everyone to check for a valid publication of the name, if the name was validly published. 
Remember, we were talking about all these editions of the code, so the requirements for valid publication were changing. So that's why if the name was published before, um, like uh, before 1911, you only have to have written description or diagnosis, and nothing else was required. But then with time, more and more requirements are added. This um, table is also from our um, presentation in Quebec, and it's available um, on a website, on a DITOM a New Taxon uh, file website that we maintain at the Academy. And um, this is a little bit modified version, which I'm going to make available online very soon. So the bottom line, the conclusion of all this presentation, the code is not static. It's changing all the time. There are differences in interpretation. There are some gray areas which can be interpreted a little bit different, uh, differently by different people. Um, <clears throat> but the code is important because it, it, it actually ensures stability. And it's important to follow best practices when publishing the names. Here are the, again, designate individual specimens, not slides as types. So the future researchers don't have to go and designate lectotypes after you do. <clears throat> clean up your mess. Deposit types in public, not personal collections. So they're available. Your types are available for study by future researchers. Check nomenclature resources to avoid publishing homonyms. So you don't have to republish, keep republishing again. And then finally, publish in peer-reviewed journals, which increases, uh, just increases probability for mistakes to be caught. That doesn't make, or <clears throat> doesn't ensure the com complete correctness of, uh, but increases chance of correct publication. So that's all I had in this presentation. If you have any questions beyond this um, webinar, here is our contact, um, uh, our contact information, email addresses for Mark and myself, and we welcome any questions. Thank you, Marina. Yeah, if people would like to type questions in the chat that they have. I think we can take a few extra minutes here to um, answer any, any questions that people have uh, regarding this, this presentation. And thank you, Marina, for providing us with this background and especially your best pra the best practices for how we work within the rules of nomenclature. No questions. <laughs> oh. Yeah, here's one from <clears throat> from Jeffrey Marina. Can you talk a little about about the concept of conserved names when names are conserved? Oh, Mark, you want me to do it? Yes. <laughs> okay. So, so what Jeffrey's asking about is the the special case when. Um, when a name needs to be conserved. Basically, it, it's often a, a situation where a name has long been used for a taxon, but when we go back in the literature, we find that that name was applied years before to something completely different. Um, in that situation, the researcher actually writes a proposal saying, I think this name and how it's being used should be conserved against this older name. Um, a diatom example of this is the genus Acanthoceros, um, which was actually initially described as a red algae. And uh, many years ago, um, Mike Wynn and I proposed that to be conserved as a diatom name. It goes in front of the, uh, the, the, the the taxon, the, I can't remember what their acronym is, the taxonomy people, they vote on it and they said, okay, let's keep that as a diatom name. And so that name is conserved. Okay, I can only add that um, what happens um, sometimes that people discover types. When they start digging in the old materials, uh, they discover types and they figure out that the application of the name was incorrect, that the type is actually not what we thought about that taxon. So if you follow the rules of nomenclature, you have to <clears throat> use that name with this type, but type is something else. 
but we so much got used to using that name with this <laughs> diatom <laughs> that we proposed to conserve that name. Uh, so it's something like breaking the rules. Basically, you are suggesting, <laughs> let's break the rules in this case. And I think we're supposed to propose that in the journal called Taxon. Yep. You basically write like a little publication, submit it to Taxon. And then I think during the Botanical Congress, um, the committee comes together and they go through all these um, propositions and they decide if they uh, say, okay, let's conserve that. Sometimes they reject. So this is um, really, you need to put your case, you know, like you, together, you know, like why you are suggesting this. Um, Marina, other, other questions we're getting. Um, from Joshua, what do you, what do you, what do we do with a taxon that's published in a, a small peer reviewed journal, but it's been, the type has been deposited in a private collection. That's the gray area because <laughs> the code says explicitly that should be recognized herbarium, herbarium collection. Um, and uh, I don't, this is not the best practice, right? To put in some personal collection, but people do that all the time. Even the like very respected diatomists do that all the time. And to be honest with you, I don't know why it's so difficult to write to a curator of some collection and just say, you know what, can you take my type? You don't have to be on good terms with me, you know, like it's my job actually to, to take that time, you know, like you just send it to me, you know, like it's, I am obliged to take it, you know, so it's not something, like it's not my courtesy, you don't need to ask me, it's just like, do it. <laughs> so this is, this is not that difficult. <laughs> and there are many collections and some people actually have this misconception also that if they describe a diatom which originated from certain geographical area, the type necessarily has to be deposited in the collection um, which is residing in that country. It's nice if you can do that, if they maintain active collections, but it, there is nothing, nothing required about that. You know, like it's, the best thing is distribute your types across different collections, actually to deposit a holotype here and maybe isotypes here and there. So like to increase the chances that people will have access but um, this is one of the unfortunate circumstances, like putting types in personal collections. Yeah, that is definitely a, a best practice to follow. Um, Marina, Sarah asked the question, when we look at modern species descriptions, oftentimes there's all kinds of exclamation marks in them. Um, exclamation mark, it, it, it just means that um, that specimen was seen by the author, as I understand that. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Nothing else. It, it's not required. Nothing in the code requires putting that exclamation mark. Yep. Um, <clears throat> how might we classify diatoms that exhibit phenotypic plasticity? Sorry? What, what? What, what, what about diatoms that exhibit quite a bit of phenotypic plasticity? Uh, one of the, one of the, well, the example they've asked about is, is uh, Phaeodactylum tricornutum, but I'm thinking about um, how we might use the, the, uh, the trinomial forma to designate uh, an ecophenotype. I think that's one way we can do it um, within the context of the code. So uh, a trinomial um, such as Stephanodiscus hanshii forma tenuis the form tenuous refers to a morphology that is formed when that diatom grows under very low silica conditions and it changes its morphology. And it seems to be sort of an on off switch with a diatom like that. It doesn't grade into that other morphology. It just grows this way or it grows this way. And that's one way that we often uh, recognize phenotypic plasticity. Um, Uh, how much does, <clears throat> how, 
how much does the size range of the diatom affect species definitions? Does it, is that an ambiguous character? Uh, uh, depends how you treat it, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there are plenty of examples when um, um, different species were described based on these extremes of the size range, right? Yeah. Um, um, and then you do more research and you discover that this, this is just the range of variation of a single clone, even, you know, like <laughs> not just the species. So you change your species concept based on these discoveries. And that's why, um, and you, maybe you just close the, spe the species which was described later, following the principle of priority. That's. Um, when, when publishing, um, when publishing species lists from a study that you've worked on, is it typical to include the author name for each species or is it better just to leave them out? And what do you think after all, all, all I said? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it should be pretty clear that you do include, because, because you know what, if you include something like um, Acnantis lancelata variety rastrata without author name, there is no way of knowing what you meant. We have these homonyms, right? So like this um, just has to be done. And I think, it, I think it, it doesn't even hurt to include the publication date. And the examples you gave showed that that was also a, an, important, very helpful. Uh, an important designator as well. So definitely author's names are pretty much required. This is a required. Uh, we only admit it like when we, we just talk to each other, uh, each other, you know, like and it's some kind of fast communication. We're talking, you know what, that navicular canal is blah, blah, blah. We, we know what we're talking about. There is just yeah. a navicular canal, but it's, um, it's not for serious publications, even if it's applied research, you know, it's that matter. <clears throat> um, Marina, can you tell us what the terms sensu lato and sensu stricto mean when we see those in taxonomic lists? I think they, like, they, they don't fall into the realm of biological nomenclature. It's basically saying something about the concept of the taxon that you're using. Um, you, you know, like when people say naviculus and solato, they probably mean, this is all in historical context. They probably mean navicula sensu hushtu. Uh, you know, like before 1990, I would say. Um, but like, that notation doesn't have any um, any role. R really, it's not not by the code. You know, it doesn't mean anything uh, from the point of view of the code. It's just like some indication how you're using that name. You know, like that. What are limits of that taxon? Okay. Um, what we've been asked: what What do we do if a, a taxonomist transfers a species to another genus? and create, you know, creates a new combination with, for that species. But subordinate taxa, such as varieties or forms, are left orphaned. What should we do in that situation? You need to transfer them to. So they need to, they need to be- If you just mention their them. names, like if you, if you just have like list in your publication, if you're like studying diatoms from some, some flora, you just think if you don't have time of transferring them, you can just include them as they are, you know, like we understand what, 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 what they are. Okay. But they, they should be transferred too. Because without that um, valid publication of a new name, you just cannot refer to them, you know, like in, in the new genus. Okay. All right. Well, well, thank you, everyone. And thank you, Marina. The, the questions have tapered off just a little bit. Um, I want to. I think we can, we can, we've gone a few minutes over the hour here. So I think it, I think we can, we can safely wrap this up. Um, Sylvia, do you want to close, close it for us? And, and uh... trying to get unmuted here. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so 
Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Marina, um, for the excellent presentation. Um, always great to review and learn all these details and the careful kind of rules and um, best practices that we need to follow to do good science. Um, so um, I really enjoyed that and hope everyone um, did as well. And we will see you again in two weeks. Um, and that will be more of a ecological uh, webinar on California algal assessment. So um, looking forward to that and looking forward to uh, seeing everyone again. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks, everyone.